a snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoy our show, please write us a review on the podcast app. Also, share us with a friend. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Calico Dresses. We feel fortunate to receive so many listener requests for particular stories. Thank you to everyone who has done so. We love to know what you think. If you're a Patreon supporter, please message us and we'll prioritize your request to the top of the queue. Tonight, by listener request, we'll read the opening to Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, a classic American 1903 children's novel by Kate Douglas Wiggin. It tells the story of Rebecca and her aunts, one stern and one kind, in the fictional village of Riverboro, Maine. Rebecca's joy for life inspires her aunts, but she faces many trials in her young life, gaining wisdom and understanding. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. One, we are seven. The old stagecoach was rumbling along the dusty road that runs from Maplewood to Riverboro. The day was as warm as midsummer, though it was only the middle of May, and Mr. Jeremiah Cobb was favoring the horses as much as possible, yet never losing sight of the fact that he carried the mail. The hills were many, and the reins lay loosely in his hands as he lolled back in his seat and extended one foot and leg luxuriously over the dashboard. His brimmed hat of worn felt was well pulled over his eyes, and he revolved a quid of tobacco in his left cheek. There was one passenger in the coach, a small, dark-haired person in a glossy buff calico dress. She was so slender and so stiffly starched that she slid from space to space on the leather cushions, though she braced herself against the middle seat with her feet and extended her cotton-gloved hands on each side in order to maintain some sort of balance. Whenever the wheels sank farther than usual into a rut or jolted suddenly over a stone, she bounded involuntarily into the air, came down again, pushed back her funny little straw hat, and picked up or settled more firmly a small pink sunshade which seemed to be her chief responsibility, unless we accept a bead purse, into which she looked whenever the condition of the roads would permit, finding great apparent satisfaction in that its precious contents neither disappeared nor grew less. Mr. Cobb guessed nothing of these harassing details of travel, his business being to carry people to their destinations, not necessarily to make them comfortable on the way. Indeed, he had forgotten the very existence 
of this one unnoteworthy little passenger. When he was about to leave the post office in Maplewood that morning, a woman had alighted from a wagon and coming up to him, inquired whether this was the Riverboro stage and if he were Mr. Cobb. Being answered in the affirmative, she nodded to a child who was eagerly waiting for the answer and who ran towards her as if she feared to be a moment too late. The child might have been 10 or 11 years old, perhaps, but whatever the number of her summers, she had an air of being small for her age. Her mother helped her into the stagecoach, deposited a bundle and a bouquet of lilacs besides her, superintended the roping on behind of an old hair trunk, and finally paid the fare, counting out the silver with great care. I want you to take her to my sisters in Riverboro, she said. Do you know Mirandy and Jane Sawyer? They live in the brick house. Lord bless your soul, he knew them as well as if he'd made them. Well, she's going there, and they're expecting her. Will you keep an eye on her, please? If she can get out anywhere and get with folks, or get anybody in to keep her company, she'll do it. Goodbye, Rebecca. Try not to get into any mischief, and sit quiet, so you'll look neat and nice when you get there. Don't be any trouble to Mr. Cobb. You see, she's kind of excited. We came on the cars from Temperance yesterday, slept all night at my cousin's, and drove from her house, eight miles it is, this morning. Goodbye, Mother. Don't worry. You know it isn't as if I hadn't traveled before. The woman gave a short, sardonic laugh and said, in an explanatory way to Mr. Cobb, she's been to Wareham and stayed overnight. That isn't much to be journey proud on. It was traveling, mother, said the child eagerly and willfully. It was leaving the farm and putting up lunch in a basket and a little riding and a little steam cars and we carried our nightgowns. Don't tell the whole village about it if we did, said the mother interrupting the reminiscences of this experienced voyager. Haven't I told you before? She whispered in a last attempt at discipline that you shouldn't talk about nightgowns and stockings and things like that in a loud tone of voice and especially when there's men folks around. I know, I know, mother, and I won't. All I want to say is, here Mr. Cobb gave a cluck, slapped the reins, and the horses started sedately on their daily task. All I want to say is that it's a journey when... The stage was really underway now, and Rebecca had to put her head out the window over the door in order to finish her sentence. It is a journey when you carry a nightgown. The objectionable word, uttered in a high treble, floated back to the offended ears of Mrs. Randall, who watched the stage out of sight, gathered up her packages from the bench at the store door, and stepped into the wagon that had been standing at the hitching post. As she turned the horse's head towards home, she rose to her feet for a moment and, shading her eyes with her hand, looked at a cloud of dust in the dim distance. Mirandy'll have her hands full, I guess, she said to herself, but I shouldn't wonder if it would be the making of Rebecca. 
All this had been half an hour ago, and the sun, the heat, the dust, the contemplation of errands to be done in the great metropolis of Milltown had lulled Mr. Cobb's never active mind into complete oblivion as to his promise of keeping an eye on Rebecca. Suddenly, he heard a small voice above the rattle and rumble of the wheels and the creaking of the harness. At first, he thought it was a cricket, a tree toad, or a bird, but having determined the direction from which it came, he turned his head over his shoulder and saw a small shape hanging as far out of the window as safety would allow. A long black braid of hair swung with the motion of the coach. The child held her hat in one hand and with the other made ineffectual attempts to stab the driver with her microscopic sunshade. Please let me speak she called. Mr. Cobb drew up the horses obediently. Does it cost any more to ride up there with you? She asked. It's so slippery and shiny down here, and the stage is so much too big for me that I rattle round in it till I'm almost black and blue. And the windows are so small, I can only see pieces of things and have most broken my neck stretching round to find out whether my trunk has fallen off the back. It's my mother's trunk, and she's very choice of it. Mr. Cobb waited until this flow of conversation, or more properly speaking, this flood of criticism, had ceased, and then said jocularly, You can come up here if you want. There ain't no extra charge to sit side of me. Whereupon he helped her out, boosted her up to the front seat, and resumed his own place. Rebecca sat down carefully, smoothing her dress under her with painstaking precision, and putting her sunshade under its extended folds between the driver and herself. This done, she pushed back her hat, pulled up her darned white cotton gloves, and said delightedly, Oh, this is better. This is like traveling. I'm a real passenger now. And down there I felt like our sitting hen when we would shut her up in the coop. I hope we have a long, long way to go. Oh, we've only just started on it, Mr. Cobb responded genially. It's more than two hours. Only two hours, she sighed. That will be half past one. Mother will be at Cousin Anne's. The children at home will have had their dinner, and Hannah cleared it all away. I have some lunch because mother said it would be a bad beginning to get to the brick house hungry and have Aunt Mirandy have to get me something to eat the first thing. It's a good growing day, isn't it? It is certain, too, too hot most. Why don't you put up your parasol? She extended her dress still farther over the article in question as she said, Oh, dear, no. I never put it up when the sun shines. Pink fades awfully, you know, and I only carry it to meet in cloudy Sundays. Sometimes the sun comes out all of a sudden, and I have a dreadful time covering it up. It's the dearest thing in my life to me, but it's an awful care. At this moment, the thought gradually permeated Mr. Jeremiah Cobb's slow-moving mind that the bird perched by his side was a bird 
of a very different feather from those to which he was accustomed in his daily drives. He put the whip back in its socket, took his foot from the dashboard, pushed his hat back, blew his quid of tobacco into the road, and having thus cleared his mental decks for action, he took his first good look at the passenger, a look which she met with a grave, childlike stare of friendly curiosity. The buff calico was faded, but scrupulously clean, and starched within an inch of its life. From the little standing ruffle at the neck, the child's slender throat rose very brown and thin, and the head looked small to bear the weight of dark hair that hung in a thick braid to her waist. She wore an odd little visored cap of white leghorn, which may either have been the latest thing in children's hats or some bit of ancient finery furbished up for the occasion. It was trimmed with a twist of buff ribbon and a cluster of black and orange porcupine quills, which hung or bristled stiffly over one ear, giving her the quaintest and most unusual appearance. Her face was without color and sharp in outline. As to features, she must have had the usual number, though Mr. Cobb's attention never proceeded so far as nose, forehead, or chin, being caught on the way and held fast by the eyes. Rebecca's eyes were like faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Under her delicately etched brows, they glowed like two stars, their dancing lights half hidden in lustrous darkness. Their glance was eager and full of interest, yet never satisfied. Their steadfast gaze was brilliant and mysterious and had the effect of looking directly through the obvious to something beyond in the object, in the landscape, in you. They had never been accounted for, Rebecca's eyes, the school teacher and the minister at temperance had tried and failed. The young artist who came for the summer to sketch the red barn, the ruined mill, and the bridge ended up by giving up all these local beauties and devoting herself to the face of a child, a small, plain face, illuminated by a pair of eyes carrying such messages, such suggestions, such hints of sleeping power and insight that one never tired of looking into their shining depths, nor of fancying that what one saw there was the reflection of one's own thought. Mr. Cobb made none of these generalizations his remark to his wife that night was simply to the effect that whenever the child looked at him, she knocked him galley west. Miss Ross, a lady that paints, gave me the sunshade, said Rebecca, when she had exchanged looks with Mr. Cobb and learned his face by heart. Did you notice the pinked double ruffle and the white tip and handle? They're ivory. The handle is scarred, you see. That's because Fanny sucked and chewed it in meeting when I wasn't looking. I've never felt the same to Fanny since. Is Fanny your sister? She's one of them. How many are there of you? 
Seven. There's verses written about seven children. Quick was the little maid's reply. Oh, master, we are seven. I learned it to speak in school, but the scholars were hateful and laughed. Hannah is the oldest. I come next. Then John. Then Jenny. Then Mark. Then Fanny. Then Myra. Well, that is a big family. Far too big, everybody says, replied Rebecca with an unexpected and thoroughly grown-up candor that induced Mr. Cobb to murmur, I swan, and insert more tobacco in his left cheek. Dear, dear, what's such a bother? and costs so much to feed, you see, she rippled on. Hannah and I haven't done anything but put babies to bed at night and take them up in the morning for years and years. But it's finished. That's one comfort. And we'll have a lovely time when they're all grown up and the mortgage is paid off. All finished? Oh, you mean you've come away? No, I mean they're all over and done with. Our family's finished. Mother says so, and she always keeps her promises. There hasn't been any since Myra, and she's three. She was born the day father died. Aunt Miranda wanted Hannah to come to Riverboro instead of me, but mother couldn't spare her. She takes hold of housework better than I do, Hannah does. I told mother last night if there was likely to be any more children while I was away, I'd have to be sent for. For when there's a baby, it always takes Hannah and me both, for mother has the cooking and the farm. Oh, you live on a farm, do you? Where's it at? Near to where you got on? Near? Why, it must be thousands of miles. We came from Temperance in the cars. Then we drove a long ways to Cousin Anne's and went to bed. Then we got up and drove ever so far to Maplewood, where the stage was. Our farm is a way off from everywheres. But our school and meeting house is at Temperance. That's only two miles. Sitting up here with you is most as good as climbing the meeting house steeple. I know a boy who's been up on our steeple. He said the people and cows look like flies. We haven't met any people yet, but I'm kind of disappointed in the cows. They don't look so little as I hoped they would. Still, they don't look quite as big as if we were downside of them, do they? Boys always do the nice splendid things, and girls can only do the nasty dull ones that get left over. They can't climb so high, or go so far, or stay out so late, or run so fast, or anything. Mr. Cobb wiped his mouth on the back of his hand and gasped. He had a feeling that he was being hurried from peak to peak of a mountain range without time to take a good breath in between. I can't seem to locate your farm, he said. Oh, I've been to Temperance. Used to live up that way. What's your folks' name? Randall. My mother's name is Aurelia Randall. Our names are Hannah Lucy Randall, Rebecca Rowena Randall, John Halifax Randall, Jenny Lind Randall, Marquis Randall, Fanny Elsler Randall, and Miranda Randall. Mother named half of us, father the other half, but we didn't come out even, so they both thought it would be nice to name Mira after Aunt Miranda in Riverboro. They hoped it might do some good. But it didn't, and now we call her Myra. We are all named after somebody in particular. Hannah is Hannah at the window binding shoes, and I am taken out of Ivanhoe. John Halifax was a gentleman in a book. Mark is after his uncle Marquis de Lafayette that died 
as twin. Twins very often don't live to grow up. Triplets almost never. Did you know that, Mr. Cobb? We don't call him Marquis, only Mark. Jenny is named for a singer, and Fanny for a beautiful dancer. The mother says they're both misfits, for Jenny can't carry a tune, and Fanny's kind of stiff-legged. Mother would like to call them Jane and Francis and give up their middle names, but she says it wouldn't be fair to father. She says we must always stand up for father because everything was against him and he wouldn't have died if he hadn't had such bad luck. I think that's all there is to tell about us, she finished seriously. Land of Liberty, I should think it was enough, ejaculated Mr. Cobb. There weren't many names left when your mother got through choosing. You've got a powerful good memory. I guess it ain't no trouble for you to learn your lessons, is it? Not much. The trouble is to get the shoes to go and learn them. These are spandy new I've got on, and they have to last six months. Mother always says to save my shoes. There don't seem to be any way of saving shoes but taking them off and going barefoot. I can't do that in Riverboro without shaming Aunt Mirandy. I'm going to school right along now when I'm living with Aunt Mirandy. And in two years, I'm going to the seminary at Wareham. Mother says it ought to be the making of me. I'm going to be a painter like Miss Ross when I go through school. At any rate, that's what I think I'm going to be. Mother thinks I'd better teach. Your farm ain't the old Hobbs place, is it? No, it's just Randall's farm. At least, that's what Mother calls it. I call it Sunnybrook Farm. I guess it don't make no difference what you call it so long as you know where it is, remarked Mr. Cobb. Rebecca turned the full light of her eyes upon him reproachfully, almost severely, as she answered, Oh, don't say that and be like all the rest. It does make a difference what you call things. When I say Randall's farm, do you see how it looks? No, I can't say I do, responded Mr. Cobb uneasily. Now, when I say Sunnybrook farm, what does it make you think of? Mr. Cobb felt like a fish removed from his native element and left panting on the sand. There was no evading the awful responsibility of a reply, for Rebecca's eyes were searchlights that pierced the fiction of his brain and perceived the bald spot on the back of his head. I suppose there's a brook somewheres near it, he said timorously. Rebecca looked disappointed, but not quite disheartened. That's pretty good, she said encouragingly. You're warm, but not hot. There's a brook, but not a common brook. It has young trees and baby bushes on each side of it, and it's a shallow, chattering little brook with a white, sandy bottom and lots of little, shiny pebbles. Whenever there's a bit of sunshine, the brook catches it and it's always full of sparkles the live long day. Don't your stomach feel hollow? Mine does. I was afraid I'd miss the stage. I couldn't eat any breakfast. 